how do you come up with a new message for Christmas when you all know the story, right? Does anybody not know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea? Anybody not know that there were shepherds out in the fields watching their flocks by night and an angel appeared to them? Anybody not know that one? Anybody not know that the shepherds went and saw Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger? That was the sign that he was the Messiah. Did anybody not know that? Okay, you all know the whole story. So what are we doing here? Okay, we're getting ready for Christmas, right? And what is, what is the perfect gift? My boys, when we're doing uh, gifts where we're actually giving something to each other, it's like, and birthdays are like this, Christmas. Uh, Dad, what does mom need? <laughs> I don't know. I'll ask her, but she's not going to tell me. <laughs> what do you need, dear? Nothing. Just be with me. All right, okay. <laughs> And, and I, I'm one of those people that throughout our years of marriage, I've always wanted to do special things. And clear back when I was um, a young man, a teenager, my grandmother, uh, had, sewing machine broke. Now, now, this was a good gift, okay? Don't, don't, don't be too harsh on me yet, okay? But she liked the old pedal sewing machine. I actually found at the sewing machine stop a pedal sewing machine and bought that for her for Christmas. And it, was, and it was just so exciting. Another year, I drove across p from California to Pennsylvania. My grandfather had raised birds. And, and when they moved from California the last time, they did this several times, from California to Pennsylvania and back and forth and all. And the last time, he had this big aviary in his backyard, and he had gotten rid of all of his birds. And he gave me one of his little um, canaries, singing canary. At Christmas time, a couple of friends of mine from Missouri Pacific jumped in a car that we borrowed from my dad. We drove across country. We went across ice that was that thick and places. We got to Terre Haute, Indiana, and, and when we got there, we were listening on the radio, and they said, the road is closed to Terre Haute, Indiana, the road we had just been driving on, where the <laughs> trucks in front of us had spun out. And, 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 I mean, it was crazy driving across that. But the canary was sitting in the car the whole way back there. And we got to um, Grandpa's house, and I brought, I brought that bird in. And the bird started singing like I'd never heard that bird sing as he heard my grandpa's voice. That was the perfect, the perfect Christmas gift to give my grandpa that year. It's even more special because that was the last Christmas that I celebrated with my grandpa. It was just several months later that he went to heaven. See, the perfect gift. What is the, the perfect Christmas gift? Well, here's the fact. God knows the perfect gift. It's him. It's him. Leslie already read the, the text for us this morning from Matthew 1, chapter 18 to 25, where it says, now, the, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Mary was found to be pregnant. <laughs> Guys, I don't think it's that subtle. You put yourself in Joseph's shoes. She's found to be pregnant? How did we find it? And, and, and how did it happen? And who did it? And now what are we going to do? This is the woman you love, and she's pregnant? Gentlemen, we all know there's only one way. You get pregnant. And if it's not because of you, you know it's some other dude. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't want to be crass about the whole thing about this. This is how the Messiah is born. But this is critical to understand how the Messiah is born, how this gift is given. Mary is found to be pregnant. And Joseph, well, have you ever turned the channel to Jerry Springer or one of those others? There's some other guy on, that's on now. And it's usually, you know, okay, who's, parent, who, who's the parent this time? Wh which, which dad is it? It's none of the three of them. It's someone else we hadn't even known about. I mean, it's, like, it goes on and on like that. And, and today, guys kind of like almost don't want to take responsibility. You need to prove it to me. What do you mean I need to prove it to you? 
You're the only one. No, no, you need to prove it to me. I mean, there's a, almost a mentality that, that men have today of, I'm not going to take responsibility for fathering. And Joseph's caught up. Come on, gentlemen. She comes to you and she says, Joseph, I'm going to have a baby. But don't, don't be upset. It's the Son of God, and God put the baby there. Well, Mary, I'll give you this when you come up with some great stories. <laughs> See, see, Joseph's problem is he's a realist. He knows how things happen, and he's in love. He's in love. And this lady to whom he's betrothed, and how do we understand all that? Well, remember, there's this year-long process. First off, the parents would come together, and they would work out a dowry and an agreement, and they would decide who was going to get married. And so Healy comes, and, and he works with Mary's uh, dad, and, and together they come up with a, an agreement, and there's a financial dowry that's passed on, and it's held by the future father-in-law until after the actual wedding. You see, they waited a year for a variety of reasons. One is this. They waited a year to see if the girl was, uh, had been involved with anybody. And how do you know? Well, you've got to wait a few months. Uh, they waited a year also because it was about trying, giving them some time to get to know one another because they may have never met. Parents have worked out, arranged the marriage, and now they're coming together. So they have this engagement. It's called betrothal. It's a year-long period of time where, and they really don't get a lot of private time, but, but it's time where they're with the family and all, and they get to know each other. At the end of the year is when you have the wedding, and that's when the marriage is consummated, the first wedding night together. Well, Joseph loves Mary. And Joseph has another problem. Joseph is a righteous man. Joseph is a man, is a man who does what's right. He does what's good. He is a man. I love it. When I was standing at my son's wedding, I was able to say, the two people that are standing here today made a commitment before they started dating. And the commitment was not to be intimate until after marriage. And it's sad, I I'm, I'm need to say, it's sad to me that very few couples that I marry can stand there and say, I haven't been intimate with this person. But for Philip and Jen, we were able to say, they made a commitment that they've been keeping up until this day that they would be pure. Joseph was a pure man. For you see, if if Mary's pregnant, who's going to get the blame for the baby? If there's no other man, then Joseph gets the blame. Obviously, the two of them were messing around ahead of time. They shouldn't have been doing that. Joseph is a righteous man. In order to hold to, his, to the fact that he is righteous and that he has honored God, he needs to do something about Mary, and he's not sure what because he loves her. See, it's not as easy, and, and, and any of you who have known someone or been in a relationship where there has been an affair, and that person comes back and they say, I love you, I'm sorry. See, the, the person that got wounded is, still loves them. They're hurt, but they still love. And they have this trauma now they've got to deal with. And that's where Joseph's at. And, and, and you can only imagine that Joseph must have wrestled with this probably for a few days, maybe weeks. We don't know how long exactly. But he wrestled with it. So much so that he's probably, it's almost giving him nightmares. It's making him hard for him to sleep. And after wrestling it for, with it for quite a while, he finally figures out a way that he can take care of the, the lady that he loves, but also keep him his own righteousness his own honor before God and the community. Because you see, he doesn't want to be cast out either. So he decides the way to do this, and there's a couple of options he has. One is he can simply go to divorce court, take her up in front there and say, ask her, is she pregnant? Yep, she's pregnant. Did Joseph make you pregnant? No, he didn't. And he could have shamed her publicly. And here's the fact that a woman with a baby outside of marriage, she's never going to marry. 
That's not good in jo Jesus and Joseph and Mary's day because how's she going to survive? Somehow on the streets, on her own. Life is bad enough for women, but to have a baby out of marriage puts her in a, just a very terrible place. So he could, he could divorce her publicly and shame her, and he gets, he gets to keep the dowry. Or he can, he's decided because he loves her, because he cares about her, and because he still wants to love her, he decides to divorce her quietly. It's a couple, three witnesses, and just say, it's over. And that's the decision he's made, and he's ready to go do it. And the night before he goes to do it, he has a dream. And the angel of the Lord comes to him. You realize, by the way, that, it's okay, that we are dealing with a miraculous birth here. And it should be a little bit unusual, shouldn't it? A little bit extraordinary. And so didn't God use dreams throughout history in order to communicate to his people? And that's what he does here with Joseph. And, and, so, and folks, this is way more than a dream. This is a visit by the angel of God who says to Joseph, Joseph, what has happened to Mary has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. Folks, you need to watch out because this does not mean like the Greek mythology and some of these other things that somehow like, like Zeus went in, formed as a snake, and somehow gave Alexander the Great was born. That's one of the myths that's out there, that, that, that Alexander the Great was born um, from uh, virgin birth. And that it was Zeus, the god, that went and had sex with his mom, and that's how they had the baby. Folks, this is not about sex. You, you just have to understand that. But God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, places himself within the womb of Mary. God resides within her womb, placed there by the Holy Spirit. It's a virgin birth. <clears throat> Isaiah 7 says, the virgin will conceive and will, give, you will give, and will give birth to a son. Folks, if Jesus is not born to a virgin, if like some have said, well, okay, she did have intimacy with Joseph, and they got pregnant. And later, God came into Jesus when he was grown up. <laughs> no. No, then that, that means that Jesus is not perfect, and he couldn't have been son of God then. Okay. There are um, many theologians and schools of thought that say, well, no, Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, and it's really not important. Really? In fact, one of the... Um, one of the theologians that I, really has some great stuff, William Barclay, is one who says, you know, well, we don't have to believe in the virgin birth, really. And you talk to Judy, I'm sure that she's having conversations around the campus of APU about whether it's a virgin birth or not. And I just got to tell you, without a virgin birth, we don't have a Messiah. It's as simple and as straightforward and as factual as that. Without a virgin birth, we don't have a Messiah because the virgin birth says that the Messiah, God himself, was planted within her womb, not put there by a man, but by God. In the seventh chapter of Isaiah and the prophecy, it says a virgin will give birth. And you need to understand the context of that passage when King Ahaz, and he's, not, he's a bad guy, and he wants a sign that God's going to deliver them. And, uh, you, you know, pick a sign. No, you, you, I don't want to do it. You know, he's just play, messing with God. And so the prophecy comes, a virgin shall give birth. In fact, uh, Isaiah will actually have a, King Ahaz, excuse me, will have a son named Emmanuel, which means God with us. And in that text, I need you to clarify, in that text, the word that is used there for virgin is the same word that's used for young lady. But not in our text. When Matthew translates things into Matthew 1 from actually Isaiah 7 and he puts it into the Greek, the word that he uses there is a word that is only used for virgin, not young lady. 
It's the Hebrew word that can double. Can be a young lady, could be a virgin. Well, that means it could have been a young lady that gave birth to Emmanuel, King Ahaz's son, and as a reminder to them that every time they say Emmanuel, and incidentally, that is the Hebrew. Emmanuel is the actual Hebrew word that's used. God is with us. Now, okay, chill, chill, Bill, chill, Bill. (laughs) The virgin will conceive. For unto us, Isaiah 9, we sang it already, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then what does it say on in the 11th chapter of Isaiah? And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And the result of his ministry shall be, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. He shall be born of a virgin. In fact, do you remember what Genesis 3 says? At the judgment of Adam and Eve, and Eve hears what she's going to suffer because she ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15 says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And it's interesting, the word there for offspring is seed. I don't know if you know anything about how we usually talk about things, but man has the seed, woman is the receiver of the seed. And in this case, Eve is told that the seed of woman will what? Crush Satan's head. Galatians 4, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a what? Woman, born under the law. The scripture is clear. Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. Now, I would pause just for one moment here. When we say that Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, Mary is not God. Some of our brothers and sisters have raised up Mary to a place equal with Jesus Christ. They will use the same descriptions. She's the living word of God. She's the Messiah. She's the Savior. That is not true. She was blessed, and she was obedient. And praise Jesus. And she was, she was a woman who was privileged like no woman has been throughout all of history. Privileged to birth and carry and hold and embrace the son of the living God, Emmanuel. God was with her. What an incredible privilege. And I would just caution you, be careful about worshiping her. She carried and held the baby Jesus, like you and I can carry and hold Christ in our lives. And we're not exalted as God either. The gift, the perfect gift, is Jesus Christ. And what is Joseph told? Joseph, you are to give him the name Jesus. The name Jesus. It means it's, it's the, the Greek for Joshua or Yeshua. You've probably heard that. It it means Jehovah is salvation or or the salvation of Jehovah. Or it can also mean, oh, Jehovah save or simply Jehovah saves. But But this name is all about salvation. When you say the name Jesus, you're saying salvation. Salvation is from God. You are to give him the name Jesus. And how does Philippians say it? And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Acts says it this way. 
verse 10 of chapter 4. Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in none other, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. What is that name? Jesus. Jesus. God, our Savior. And how does... Matthew go on to describe that. He says, he will be called Jesus because he will what? He will save his people from their sins. Barclay, and this is an okay comment, he says, before Jesus came, men had only vague and shadowy and often quite wrong ideas about God. They could only at best guess and grope. But Jesus could say, he who has seen me has what? Seen the Father. Oh, in Jesus, you see, we see the love, the compassion, the mercy, the seeking heart, the purity of God as nowhere else in all the world. He goes on to say, the essence of Matthew's story is that in the birth of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God was operative as never before in the world. It is the Spirit who brings God's truth to men. It is the Spirit who enables men to recognize that truth when they see it. It is the Spirit who is God's agent in the creation of the world. It is the Spirit who alone can recreate the human soul when it has lost the life it ought to have. Who does Jesus save? Us, his people. What does he save us from? Our sins. And how does he save us? By his death on that cross. By his atonement. But take note, folks. When he saves us from our sins, he's not just saving us so that we can say, okay, now I'm forgiven. But he's also saving us so we don't sin. He's not only forgiving us, but he's taking the power of sin away from us as well. He saves us from condemnation and guilt and shame. <laughs> he saves us from love of ourselves <laughs> and sin. And his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. In his uh, study on Matthew 1, Craig Keener from InterVarsity says, but as God with us, Jesus is also the fully human one who saves his people by the cross. Matthew thus invites us to consider and worship the God who accepted the ultimate vulnerability, born as an infant to poor and humiliated parents into a world hostile to his presence. Of all the world's faiths, only Christianity announces a God who embraced our pain with us. Lewis Johnson says, talks about a, the writings of Philip Brooks. And he says, Philip Brooks was right when he wrote, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by, years go by. Yet in the dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Johnson goes on and says, Philip Brooks was a preacher. And he also emphasized the need of personal appropriation. Is he really God with us? Have we responded according to the last stanza of the hymn? O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Folks, that's the perfect gift. God is with us. God 
the creator of the universe, the one who is beyond the expanse of stars and space, the one who counts and names the stars and knows the number of hairs on your head, the one who knew you when you were being formed in your mother's womb, the one who created and gave us life like we can't imagine, the intricacies of the human body or the intricacies of this creation, that one, that powerful one is the one who is what? us. God comes to save us from our sins. As we take communion in a few moments, we're remembering he died on a cross to take our sins away. And God, the creator of the universe, this awesome God, who, yes, had the miraculous power and the ability to place within a young woman's womb himself and to inhabit that and tabernacle there for a period of time until he was born, and then to stay in this human body and to be man for all of eternity. That one, the word became flesh that dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. That one is God with us. Did you see how the text ends? Hey, guys. The text ends. He gave him the name Jesus. Who's he? Joseph. Joseph gives him the name Jesus. Joseph is one incredible man, isn't he? We don't know a lot about him, but he has to be amazing. Able to accept the fact that his wife is pregnant and to believe that this is God within her. Able to believe it so much that he takes her on as his bride, even though everyone in the whole community, and he's from a little town called Nazareth, okay, there are not a lot of people there, and so everyone's going to say, <laughs> yeah, we know what they did. And in spite of all that shame and guilt that he would have carried, Joseph does what? He names this baby. Jesus, because he believes what the angel says. He believes Mary, he believes the angel, he believes God. This is the long-awaited Messiah. This is the one. This is God is our Savior. This is God with us. Praise the Lord. I believe we're going to name him Jesus. You see, Joseph takes responsibility for this baby because he believes. Don't go through the motions. Don't miss it this year. Don't get caught up in all the wrappings and all the parties and everything else. God.